Hi, welcome to today's class. Uh, my name is Mark Shepard, and what we're going to do today is learn how to fill out the residential purchase agreement correctly, hopefully the first time. And uh, we're going to go over the actual document and some of the accompanying documents with it. So to get started, I'm going to share my screen here and hopefully pull up a contract. <clears throat> okay. So first of all, let's go over some of the uh, terms and definitions that we need to know when we're dealing with this contract. Uh, the definitions and terms of interest in the California Residential Purchase Agreement and Joint Escrow Instructions. The word agent in the purchase agreement is the name of the brokerage. And even when we're referring to the agent specifically, we're still referring to the brokerage. Acceptance means the time the offer is accepted in writing by a party and delivered to you and personally received by the other party or that party's authorized agent in accordance with the terms of this offer or a final counter offer. Days means cal calendar days. However, after acceptance, the last day for performance of any act required by this agreement, including the close of escrow, shall not include a Saturday, Sunday, or a legal holiday and shall instead be the next day. Days after means the specified number of calendar days after the occurrence of the event specified, not counting the calendar date of which the specified event occurs and ending at 11.59 p.m. on that final day. So for instance, if we sold a property on Friday night, day one would be Saturday. If we if we uh, had an acceptance of a property, if a contract, say on Monday at noon, day one would be Tuesday. And that's how uh, all uh, days are counted in this contract. <clears throat> Conditions versus contingencies. A condition is a clause that states an action or situation that will occur. Most items in a purchase agreement are conditions. A contingency is a clause that gives the beneficiary of a choice on how to proceed. The pre-written contingencies in the purchase agreement are for the benefit of the buyer, although the seller-based contingencies can occur. There are three elements of a contingency. First of all, the subject. What's the contingency about? A clear definition of the subject matter is necessary. The time period, there must be a period of time that the contingency will remain in effect. And then finally, recourse, a description of what happens if the contingency is exercised. Also an understanding of the impact on the buyer's deposit. And we're gonna talk about that more in depth when we actually go through the contract. One thing you wanna know about this particular version of the contract that we're all using now, it's called an active contingency removal. This purchase agreement works on an active contingency removal and a con contingency is not removed until the principal with the benefit of that contingency in writing removes it. And you remove it with CAR form CR, which stands for contingency removal. This is true even though the time period for the contingency has been exceeded. So in plain English, what that means, the contingency is open until it's removed. Even if a contingency says uh, 17 days, if you don't remove it until the 25th day, it's open until the 25th day. And there are ways to remove it, ways to address it. And we'll talk about that when I go over the specific contract. One way to end this contingency is to give a notice to perform. And that's a notice for buyer to perform or a notice to seller to perform. It can be served to the principal who has not removed their contingency in a timely fashion. Should this occur, the principal with the benefit of the contingency will have a time period to remove the contingency or the other principal would have the right to unilaterally cancel the transaction. And let me just say, when you use these contingency removals, uh, these notices to perform, you will cannot give a notice to perform before two days before the end of that specific contingency. So if a contingency is set to end on Wednesday, for instance, you could not give a contingency removal before Monday because that's the 48 hours, unless of course you change the terms of that, but that's the way it usually works. So now let's go over some of the accompanying documents that are with the purchase agreement. So if you don't know how to get into zip forms, uh, please speak to your manager. Zip forms is 
uh, the database that where all our contracts, all our forms are stored, and that's where we uh, receive pretty much all the documents, including the Rodeo documents, specifically needed for a transaction. So when we pull up the contract for the RPA, the Residential Purchase Agreement, the first thing that's attached to that agreement is called the Disclosure Regarding Real Estate Agency Relationships. Now, for these accompanying forms, I'm going to broadly talk about them. I'm not going to go over every single word, but how this basically works is the way I would explain it to my buyer when I'm, uh, you know, pre preparing an offer is the state of California makes me disclose uh, who works for who, and that's the agency relationship. So in the state of California, an agent can represent a buyer or a seller or both. And of course, we have to be honest to all parties and uh, be fair to all parties, whether they're our client or not. And what we do after I would explain it to them, the buyer would sign on this line and I would sign on this line and I have made my agency disclosure. It's very important to make this disclosure because uh, it's, it's most important for our client to know who is representing who, whether we're representing both sides of the transaction or one side of the transaction. But that's a real uh, quick way to understand this particular form. The next form that pops up is called the Fair Housing Discrimination and Advisory. So on this one, there's nothing to fill in. Uh, the clearest way I can say this is we just do not discriminate against anybody, whether it's age, sexual orientation, race, uh, citizenship, medical condition, Anything that you can think of, we do not discriminate. So take your time and read this form, but that's basically what it's saying. So on page two, we will have the buyer sign this and the seller, of course. The next form that pops up is the PRBS or the possible representation of more than one buyer or seller, disclosure and consent. This form states that sometimes we may be working with multiple people uh, during a transaction or even before a transaction takes place. For instance, maybe I'm showing the property to multiple buyers. Maybe I'm working with a seller and a buyer. Maybe um, I'm working with uh, multiple sellers. Uh, maybe uh, all kinds of situations can occur. The basic thing is that we're disclosing to them what the possibilities are. And I'm not going to go too deep into this form because I want to make sure we have time to go over the whole contract, but that's basically what this is saying. One other item I want to point out here that offers are not necessarily confidential. The buyer is advised that the seller or listing agent may disclose the existence, terms, or conditions of the buyer's offer unless all parties and their agent have signed a written confidential confidentiality agreement. That being said, let me just say, typically, we do not share the contents of our offers with other parties that we are not representing. And uh, for instance, when we're in a counter offer, uh, we would not uh, disclose uh, what the top maybe that our buyer would, would pay because that's a confidential um, agreement between the buyer and his agent. Or conversely, if you were a listing agent, you wouldn't necessarily disclose what's the lowest price a, a listing uh, seller may accept. So that's, so that's what I mean. We have to really um, keep it really uh, up above board, but not disclose uh, confidential information, unless, of course, our, our client, the buyer or seller, wishes us to do, to do that. And that's basically what this form is saying. The next form, the Wire Fraud and Electronic Funds Transfer Advisory. This form basically is telling the buyer to be very, very careful when they wire their money to escrow, double and triple check, because we do not want the buyer to wire the um, deposit to someplace where it may be fraudulently taken. Okay. It doesn't happen often, but it can happen. So that's why we have this form. We want the buyer to be very, very careful and double check with the escrow where this uh, money is being transferred to. And now we're going to come up to the actual residential purchase agreement. So I have pre-filled out this form to the most typical way that we use it. And I'm going to go over some of the items that maybe we don't use typically. But um, just to make it easier to understand, I have it pre-filled so we uh, understand 
the most logical way that it's used and the most typical way that it's used. So I'm gonna go through this um, line by line for the most part, at least the first three pages, which are the sections that we actually fill out. And I'm gonna make commentary about uh, what it all means. Uh, so at this class, we don't have to go over every single word of every single paragraph, but I do urge you to read it so you understand what's going on. Before we start on that, I wanna say the way this contract is laid out, it's in grid form. You know, previously to this version of the contract, it would be blanks all through the 16 pages of a contract. And we'd have to search for the items. But what CAR has done is lumped it all together in a three-page grid. So for instance, uh, paragraph 3A, 5 and 5B, it talks about the purchase price. If I want to learn more about that, I will go, go ahead to paragraph 5, a and B, and it tells all about the purchase price and the deposit. So if there's anything that you want to know about the line that you're addressing, you look it up by the paragraph number. Okay, so now let's start at the top of the contract, and we're going to go through it, and we're going to fill this thing out. So I wrote this particular contract on August 31st, so that's when I dated it. It's an offer from my buyer, who happens to be named Bonnie Buyer, and she's putting in an offer at 3620 Louise Avenue in the city of Encino, the county of Los Angeles. I put in the zip code and I put in the property parcel number. We find the parcel number through the tax records and it's usually in the MLS uh, sheet as well. But we do wanna have the, the uh, parcel number and the address so there's no discrepancy. We have to make sure that we're talking about the correct property. The terms of the purchase price are specified below and on the following pages. Buyer and seller are referred to here, herein as parties. Brokers and agents are not parties to that agreement. And that's you and I. So now we talk about the agency disclosure. So it's very important that we get this right because when the DRE comes and pulls a contract, that's usually the first thing they look at, you know, if we got the agency correct. So in this particular case, remember I'm writing the offer. The listing uh, company is called Another Realty. I put down their license number. And another realty represents the seller exclusively. The seller's agent is Andrea Agent, and she represents a seller exclusively. And I'm going to put both of, the, of her license number as well as, like I said, the uh, company license number. I'm with Rodale Realty, of course. So that's my brokerage firm, Rodale Realty, Inc. And uh, my name, Mark Shepard. So I represent the buyer. Rodale re represents the buyer. And Mark represents the buyer both exclusively. By the way, if you ever write uh, a contract on another Rodeo Realty agent or another Rodeo Realty office listing, we would put Rodeo Realty up here. In that case, and this gets tricky, and but in that case, Rodeo would be representing both the buyer and the seller. And Andrea, if she was with Rodeo Realty, even though she was with a different office, even if she's in a different office, she would be representing both the buyer and the seller. So our license number, as far as Rodeo, would be the same. And then Andrea's license number would be there and Mark's license number would be there. So in any regard, it's very important to get this right because I uh, am important to get it right the first time. So you don't want to go back and have to re-explain it after your offer is accepted and your manager kicks it back to you and says you got the agency wrong. However, if you do make a mistake, you don't go to jail, but we do have a another form, which is called the confirmation of agency relationships, which is what this section is, as, as you can see here. This is a confirmation of the following agency relationships, and we're confirming who's representing who. So that so that's this section. It's very important to get it right. Okay, number 2C, more than one brokerage represents the seller or the buyer. We don't typically use that, so I left it blank. How would we use it? For instance, maybe the seller was getting a divorce and more than one bro brokerage company would represent the seller. Maybe the wife got one uh, company to list the property, to co-list it, and the, and the husband uh, co listed with another. Or perhaps two agents from different companies share a buyer. Not typically happening, but I have seen it happen. And in that case, that is why this is here. But like I said, I left it blank because typically we don't use it. 
potentially competing buyer and sellers. The parties each acknowledge the receipt of the PRBS, which we just spoke about, and that is disclosure and consent about the possibilities of representing different people in a transaction, even though they may not be related. And now we're going to go over the purchase price and the allocation of costs. So let me start off to say my buyer wants to write an offer of this property for $1 million. Um, she's getting a loan. So the purchase price, I'm going to go over here, write down $1 million. It's not all cash. She's getting a loan. If it was all cash, then of course I would check that box. The close of escrow is 30 days after acceptance. So I check that box. I could have made it 45 days or 60 days or 37 days. Typically it's 30, 45 or 60. These days, more often than not, I see it at 30 days. The reason I say 30 days and not at 30 days from today's date and locking it in a date is because if I did that and maybe it took me three days to negotiate the acceptance, and sometimes it takes five days, I would lose those days in terms of the escrow period if I had a drop dead date here. And that's why I said 30 days. So even if it took me five days to negotiate, it would be 30 days after we came to an agreement. The expiration of the offer. Uh, this offer expires three days after it's written, unless we change it. Sometimes we like to change it. And sometimes by doing that, we shoot ourselves in the foot. It's up to you. Uh, sometimes we pressure the other side to accept our offer, and then all of a sudden our offer expires. So that's not good. However, let me say, if an offer ever does expire, you can always bring it back to life as long as both parties agree. The initial deposit. Okay, typically it's 3% of the purchase price. And I'll talk more about why it's 3% later, but it's typically 3% of the purchase price. We're talking about the deposit. So 3% of the million dollars is $30,000. And that has to be placed into escrow within three business days after acceptance. Now, all the contingencies of this agreement, and this is one of them, all the contingencies are uh, calendar days except for this one. The reason this one is not is because escrow is only open on business days, okay? So if I, like I said before, if I had my offer accepted on Friday night, although day one of the contract would be Saturday, day one regarding this specific contingency would be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So I would have to get it in by the end of business on Wednesday to qualify. And actually, I think technically it's, it's uh, 11.59 at night, uh, and but the escrow is not open, so it doesn't do you any good if you uh, uh, if you use that figure. Let's just say you know by the end of business day. But that's how that works as far as this contingency. Increased deposit. I didn't fill this in because typically we don't. If I wanted to, I would say increased deposit. Maybe I put in another twenty thousand dollars, and on, and I check this maybe upon the removal of the inspection contingency. I don't think I would ever do that. But if you wanted to do something like that, that's how you do it. Now let's talk about the loan amount. My buyer is putting 20% down. So 20% down means she's getting an 80% loan. So 80% of a million dollars is $800,000. So her loan, her first loan is going to be in the amount of $800,000. It's a conventional loan. If it wasn't FHA loan or a VA loan, I would click the appropriate box and then form F. VAC would be added, and that has some other terms that are required when there's this type of loan that's being used. But typically it's conventional, although, you know, there are a lot of FHA and VA loans around as well. The next portion I want to talk about is we have to say what type of loan we're getting. So it defaults to a fixed rate. Maybe we can do an adjustable loan. As interest rates go up, maybe that'll be more popular. At this point in time, almost everybody is getting a fixed rate. But I do have to write the specifics so the seller is accepting this subject to the terms that we're giving to him. So on this particular loan, I said the interest rate not to exceed 7% and the buyer to pay up to one point. When I wrote this contract, the interest rate was 6.5%. So what I typically do is add a half a percent to that amount to allow for fluctuation before the buyer locks in his rate. So since it was 6.5, I wrote it at 7. And then I wrote one point 
typically buyers pay a point. Sometimes they pay a point and a half. They can pay more. They can pay two points. But that's typically what it is. So that's why I wrote this. So before I go further, I want to show you something else that you can do. And I'm going to go ahead to section G2 under additional finance terms. And I would use this instead of what we just talked about. We do not want to use both because they contradict each other. Instead of writing down the exact interest rate, I would just write this sentence, buyers to obtain prevailing interest rate and terms. And that covers my buyer for whatever loan they want to get and that they can qualify for. I want to be careful. I, sometimes you'll see buyer to obtain best prevailing interest rate and terms. We don't want to use that word best. That's what gets us in trouble. Because when we use the word best, what's best for me may not be best for you. What's Best at uh, noon may not be best at four o'clock. You know, interest rates are always changing. Uh, every buyer has a different credit score. So we don't want to get ourselves in trouble. And that would do that possibly when we say best. So if we're going to use a sentence, we want to say buyer to obtain prevailing interest rate and terms. So either that or fill in the interest rate. Like I said, we do not want to use both or we're going to find ourselves in trouble because they conflict. So just to be clear, on this one, if buy not to exceed a seven percent, if that's what the interest rate is that I wrote, and the buyer gets a loan at seven point two percent, she can still take it and go forward if she wants, but the seller can't make her go forward if it only goes to seven percent. On the other sentence, the way I said, buyer to obtain prevailing rate in terms, she would have to take any uh, loan that she uh, qualifies for. And that that usually works. Um, I've written it with these. I've written offers with these uh, specific interest rates, and I've been countered on with using the sentence that I described. Or I usually write an offer with the sentence that I've described, prevailing interest rate in terms. And then sometimes I get countered by an agent with these specific interest rates. So there's no absolute correct one to use. You can use either one, and sometimes you're up to the discretion of the listing agent on what they prefer when they issue you a counteroffer. But in any regard, those are your options. Uh, number two, uh, paragraph E2, uh, this would be additional financed amount. We haven't seen a lot of this lately, but as uh, the, the lending market you know, always progresses and always changes like it has in years past, maybe we're going to see more uh, seller financing. Maybe we want the seller to carry a second trustee for $30,000. So if that was the case, I would write $30,000, maybe at 8% interest rate, oh, excuse me, not, I would write not to exceed 8% purchase price, per interest rate, excuse me. So it'd be $30,000, 8% interest rate, and I check the box here for seller financing, if I was doing that. But I don't typically do that, so I did not fill this in. So if there's another uh, finance amount in addition to what we said here, this is where you put it. Sometimes uh, your lender will split it up into a couple smaller loans if they get really creative, if that happens. And how do you know that's going to happen? You ask your lender that you're working with what the specific loan and terms are, and they'll tell you, and this is where you write it. The occupancy type it defaults to their primary residence, and that's fine. If it was a vacation home, a rental, or, 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 or whatever, but not a primary residence, I would click the appropriate box and disclose that. The reason we want to disclose it is because if it's not the primary, very often the interest rate is a little higher and the lender wants to know that. And then the balance of down payment is $170,000. So it's $170,000, and... There's an $800,000 loan, and they put in $30,000 as a deposit. So you add the deposit plus the amount that they're going to bring in prior to the close of escrow and the loan, and those three figures should add up to $1 million or the purchase price. Now, note I've used uh, real round numbers here, so it's pretty easy to do in our head. Sometimes the numbers are not so easy, and uh, that's why we always want to double check it. A, well, caution on this particular version of the contract, no matter what numbers you write up here, it'll always add up to the purchase price, but it may put the numbers in a way that you don't want them to be put, or maybe if you don't put it in the correct, the correct uh, place, like if I put it in increased deposit rather than the deposit amount, it would all add up, but the contract isn't saying what we want it to say. So be very careful as to which blank that you put your numbers in, and once again, 
and what the actual numbers are, and it will add up to the purchase price. So now on the bottom of this page, as is in every page of this contract, pretty much, the buyer will initial this, and we'll go on to page two. Now, the top of page two, paragraph G1, seller credit to buyer. There's not typically a seller credit to buyer at this point. And we're talking about when we write the offer. So possibly, maybe a lender will tell us that uh, the buyer needs to have some closing costs paid by the lender. So if the closing costs, uh, say the buyer needs $30,000 from the lender, so I would check that box and I would write $30,000 and that would be a seller credit applied to closing costs. Now, remember, you always have to run all these credits by your lender because sometimes the lenders don't um, allow you to add the amount that the buyer would like you to add possibly. But let's just say this is what the lender told us, $30,000, and that's that. If we don't need to use this, I don't use it. Why? Because it gets very confusing because this million-dollar offer all of a sudden turned into a $970,000 offer, right? Because if the seller is giving $30,000 back to the buyer, it's not truly a million dollar price. So now that if a seller wanted to counter to a million uh, 30, right? He'd have to counter to a million 60 to make it to be a million 30 off of this offer that's a million, but it's really 970. So if you follow my logic, that's why. And if I've confused you, that's my point. It gets confusing. That being said, if you need to do it, of course, then do it. And this is where you do it. Now we're going to go to this G3. For the most part, you're not going to use this. I don't know very many people in Southern California that do use this, but real quickly, I'll explain to you what it means. So should you come across it, or even if you're a listing agent, you'll know what it means. So G3 refers to the buyer's broker that may have a, an agreement for the buyer to pay the brokerage fees of the buyer's agent. If that's the case, and this box is clicked, that would say seller agrees to pay the obligation of buyer to compensate buyer's broker under a separate agreement. Seller's broker offer, if any, to compensate buyers is unaffected unless otherwise agreed. So that means as a listing agent, it's not affected. But let's say uh, in broad strokes, let's say I had a buyer broker agreement with a buyer that I say I'm not going to work for less than 3%. So on that contract, it, on the buyer broker agreement, it would say that I'm the buyer is to pay me 3% unless he gets I, me or Rodeo, my company, gets paid from the listing agent. So now let's say the listing agent is offering 2.5% to the selling agent, which is typical. So there's an, So in that case, if this box was checked, according to that agreement, the seller would pay 2.5% of that 3%, and then the seller out of his pocket would have to, well, his seller already has agreed to that because it says that in the MLS, the 2.5%, and I hope I'm not confusing you. But in addition to that, the seller would have to pay an additional half percent because that is what I agree with my buyer, depending on how I filled out that buyer broker agreement. You know, sometimes the buyer pays the difference. Sometimes they want the seller to pay the whole thing. So in any regard, uh, be real careful with this most likely you're not going to see it. If I'm a listing agent and I see this, I would just delete it. And how do you delete it? On my counter offer, I would say paragraph G3 to be deleted in its entirety. And then we don't have to worry about it because at this point in time, typically uh, the seller will be paying a uh, buyer's broker and the seller's broker unless something changes. But that's the way it is currently at this time, unless we have a buyer broker agreement. And that's what that means. So I'm not going to spend any more time in there because I know it's confusing enough as it is. The next H1 and H2, we're talking about the verification of all cash. If it was an all cash offer, which it's not, I would have to have my verification, meaning where is this cash that they're using, proof that it exists attached to my offer. Or of course, or within three days if I check that box or whatever. Since my buyer is getting a loan, I need the verification of down payment and closing costs attached to the offer. Unless I click that box and make it three days or two days or whatever, we don't really want to do that, though, because we want our offer to be accepted. And these days, if all those facts are not attached to the offer, the seller is not going to accept it. He's not going to wait three days to know if your buyer is qualified or if your buyer has the cash. So what is it we're talking about? So attached to our offer, 
we want um, a proof of funds, and that is a bank account or or the trust account or wh whatever account uh, that the uh, money is coming from. We want the proof of that attached to the software when we submit it to the seller. In addition to that, she's getting a loan. We want that verification of loan application attached to the offer and a letter from the lender. And it would say something to the effect of they're qualified for a loan up to a million dollars, their credit is good and uh, all that stuff. But here we come to a different point. In this particular contract, prior to this contract, we would brokers would use pre-qualification and pre-approval generically to kind of mean the same thing, but they don't mean the same thing. And I'm glad they broke it up. So a pre-qualification. That would be if I took out my buyer the first time and they'd never talked to a lender, they like a, a house on the first weekend I showed them. And uh, now what are we gonna do? We're writing an offer and they need something from a, a lender. So I would call my LA mortgage rep and I would say, please talk to my buyer. They'd ask them a bunch of questions. And after speaking to the buyer, hopefully would say, yeah, they're great. They're good to buy this house. And I'm gonna send you a pre-qualification uh, letter. And that would say that what, like what I just described. The next step would be a pre-approval. Now, if I actually had them talk to my lender prior or during the course of me taking them and showing them properties before we wrote an offer, a pre-approval would be possibly that they actually filled out a loan application. The lender would have more time to actually run their credit report, go over their salaries and their car payments and, and whatever other bills they have and a more thorough examination. That's called a pre-approval. The final choice we have is a fully underwritten pre-approval. And this is the next best thing to cash out of all these three. So a fully underwritten pre-approval means that they actually are approved for a loan. They just don't know what house they're buying. So what we need is an address of a house and an appraisal showing that the house is worth what we're paying for it, okay, what we're offering. So those are our three choices. If you show a house and your buyer wants to write it, all you can get is that phone conversation with a pre-qualification, don't let that stop you. I've sold many, many houses over the years just with that. But that being said, the more uh, proof that you have and the closer it is to a fully underwritten pre-approval, the better it is, but don't let that stop you. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the final verification of condition. That's what we in the business call a walkthrough that typically takes place within five days of the close of escrow, within five days. So uh, this is not a contingency, by the way, it's a courtesy. Um, and, and because our contingencies would hopefully be removed by the time we do that walkthrough. That's just to verify that uh, nobody uh, drove through the garage into the kitchen and there's a 10 foot hole. Also, maybe we've had the seller to do some uh, repairs, that kind of thing. We want to verify that, that they're there. So once again, this is not a contingency, but we do have some power before we close to ask to make sure these things are corrected. But uh, typically it all works out okay. If you do have an issue after the close of escrow, typically you may have to go to a small claims court. Uh, very rarely happens, although it does happen, but very rarely, because usually everybody wants it to be on the up and up. And if the sink is still dripping and, and they overlooked it, most likely we'll fix it. But in any regard, that's the story on this walkthrough, because I just want to be real clear, it's not a contingency, although some people try to make it so. Assignment of request. This is when uh, we may assign it to another buyer. So maybe I wrote this offer uh, with John Smith of GS Construction or JS Construction. And uh, maybe during the course of this offer, he decided he wanted to write it to another uh, member of John Smith Construction. So he would may assign this to another person. Sometimes uh, uh, there's a married couple and they decide to buy it in the name of one spouse. And then during the course of escrow, they want to transfer it to the other spouse or maybe a parent because they find out maybe that they qualify better in that certain manner. So in any regard, that's called an assignment request. So if there is an assignment, we would make that assignment request in writing. There's a form for that. And of course, a seller has to accept that. It doesn't automatically happen. So I I cut down uh, the amount of days, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, about all these contingencies, because we don't need 17 days, and I would never want that if I was a listing agent, because 
well, I want to know what's going on. You know, within the first seven days, seven days, the first 10 days, I want to know that my property, my listing would be uh, solid and going through. So I want to make sure that contingencies are short. And that's why when I'm writing an offer as a buyer's agent, I also want to make sure they're as short as I can make it while still protecting my buyer because I want the seller to accept it and not counter me even shorter, okay? So it's kind of a dance here that we do, just the happy medium. So that's why I cut this down. Now, the next section is actually contingencies. So you see they're all defaulted to 17 days. We don't really need 17 days for all these contingencies. So I shorten them. Once again, why? Not because I want to trap my buyer into something or make it difficult, but I want the seller to accept my offer. So let's talk about the first one, which is loan. We don't need a full 17 days, at least at this period of time, to have a loan approval. 14 days is more than enough. So I just want to make it appealing to the sellers so they accept my offer. Sometimes in this crazy market that we're coming off of, and very often, actually, I should say in that market, people were checking this box and there's no loan contingency. So that means they still, if they want, can possibly get a loan, but if they can't get a loan and, and this loan, no loan contingency box is checked, and all other things being equal, they may lose their deposit if by the end they can't get that loan. So you gotta be really careful with this. Sometimes you use this strategy and that's okay as long as your buyer's on the same page, but that's something we have to discuss with our client. It's not something that we tell them to do. So anyways, uh, my, my buyer is taking a loan. So I said her loan contingency is 14 days. Now let's get back to these contingencies again. Uh, remember I talked about the notice to perform. So my contingency that I wrote here is 14 days. Now, if it's a, a, a good listing agent on the other side, at the 12th day or the 14th day or somewhere around that point, they would, would be talking to me and say, your loan contingency is getting up. Or if it's actually on the 14th or the 12th day, maybe they want to give me a notice to perform. Say, remove this loan contingency or we're going to cancel. If they decide to do that, a tough stance, that's how you do it with that notice to perform. Remember, we talked about it before. Okay, so that happens. Now, if they have a lazy broker that didn't realize the loan contingency was not removed and we're 25 days into it, and they tell, give us a notice to perform, and my buyer is having a trouble getting his loan, remember on the 25th day, he would have to give me a notice to perform, and that notice to perform typically is two days after it's received, which my 25 days would be 27 days, which if... According to my contract, if it's 30 days, we're getting real close to the close of escrow. So uh, if my buyer is having trouble getting a loan, we're on the 25th day, we get a notice to perform, then my buyer can say, you know what? I think I'm going to cancel because I just can't get this loan. And the buyer will get his deposit back. Once the loan contingency is removed and you can't get a loan, that, loan con that uh, deposit may be lost. You know, sometimes you always have to take a leap of faith because there's no perfect answer to this, to this. Um, because if you don't remove your contingency and you want to play it perfectly safe until the very last day, they may cancel you anyways. So there's a, a, a you have to take a leap of faith and be fair all the way around. So at some point, you most likely will have to remove a contingency once you feel comfortable about it. Okay. If not, you're going to get asked to remove it. Now, the, let's talk about the appraisal. Like I said, in this crazy market, they were saying no loan contingency. They were saying no appraisal contingency. Why? Because buyers were paying any price just to get the house. So even if the house uh, maybe was worth um, $850,000 and my buyer is paying a million, she's okay with that. And if she wanted to remove the appraisal contingency, that's how she does it. Okay. But let's just say uh, my buyer is not comfortable with, with removing the appraisal contingency. So what I've done here is I've shortened it to 10 days. So within 10 days, we're going to get an appraisal and we're going to know if there isn't a, a problem with the property appraising. Remember, it, it has to appraise at the purchase price if there is an appraisal contingency. Um, I could even make it shorter. Now, sometimes if I make it so short, so the seller doesn't counter me, but I still want to be very, very attractive and aggressive with my offer, maybe I'd have to pay for a rush fee to get that appraisal done maybe in four days or five days or whatever. Uh, and that's a, another secret weapon that we have up our sleeve just to make sure we know before we remove it that the property appraises, okay? So that's one way if they're really nervous about an appraisal contingency. 
So my buyer, I talked to her, she's not real keen on removing the appraisal contingency, but she said, you know what? I can probably have another $50,000 I could put in this property. I said, oh, then you know, let's do this. So in that case, I can use this right here and I'll put in what's called an appraisal gap, an appraisal contingency based on the appraised value and the minimum purchase price, or I would check this box and I'd write $950 thousand dollars. So in this case, the property only has to appraise for $950,000, even though she's paying a million at this point in time, and she would bring in the additional $50,000 out of her pocket. So that's called an appraisal gap. One thing to be aware of, now if they counter me um, at a million two, my buyer, which the, the property, that, that appraisal gap is still built into our counter offer unless we remove it. Now, a lot of people, many people don't realize that appraisal gap is still built in even the counter offer. So if they're not comfortable paying $50,000 above, uh, you know, your money that you have, like on a two, a million two purchase price, you have to pay a million, uh, you'd uh, put an additional 50. So it'd mean a million uh, 50, million 150, and you have to bring that extra $50,000 to make it to the million two. If if you don't want that to be in existence, that appraisal gap, make sure you remove it on the counter offer. But in any regard, that's another option that we have just to make it a little bit more aggressive without totally removing the appraisal contingency. That being said, most people either remove it or they leave it in, you know, but you have this tool if you need it. Investigation of a property and informational access to the property. This is what we call the inspection period and the buyer investigation period. Now, the buyer has a right to inspect everything from A to Z. And in paragraph 8C and paragraph 12, it tells all about it, where they can inspect anything uh, from soup to nuts. And if they don't like it, uh, they can back out during this contingency period and get their deposit back. Okay. Uh, so, um, Let's say they remove uh, their inspect investigation and inspection contingency after 10 days. And if I didn't write 10 days here, the informational access would be 17. Now, this is not a contingency. I like to have them match because of all the years that I've been doing this, I found if they don't match, it's a headache. Why? Because my inspection and investigation has been removed at 10 days. And if they had 17 days for informational access, maybe their parents are coming in from out of town and their parents come in from Ohio and they say, ah, are you kidding me? You paid a million dollars for this? We know uh, back in Ohio, we can get this for 475, you know? So if that's the case, who needs the headache? They're still bound because it's not a contingency, but it's a real headache. Or maybe they have somebody coming in to measure the carpets or the blinds. And one of these workmen say something negative about the property or one of their friends that come in and say something negative, who needs the headache? So I like to have them both together. And once it's over, it's over. And that's that. And then we move on towards the close of escrow. So that's my feeling on it. But of course, you can do what you like. These next uh, contingencies, a review of seller documents, the preliminary title report, common interest disclosures, that would be a the HOA disclosures, a homeowners association, and review of leaned or leased items that would typically be like maybe a solar company if it was leased. All those, I shorten them because we don't need 70 days for all that. That being said, let's say uh, the preliminary title report, I said it within seven days because we want to make sure that we buy it with clear title and that's part of our contract, right? So if they didn't give it to me in 17 days, say they gave it to me in 15 days instead of seven. Okay, if they gave it to me in 15 days, I still have five days after that to say I disapprove. And if I think in this one, this is not the type of contingency uh, that I have to uh, remove it. I think it is automatically removed if we don't uh, object to it within five days because we're accepting it, okay? But you have five days after that delivery to uh, not accept it if indeed uh, it, it lapses beyond the seven days that we agreed or whatever time frame they give it to us. So we just, there's still protection in there. That being said, you know, that why would you give a seller notice to perform? This might be a good reason. So we might give the seller a notice to perform. I want the preliminary title report within two days or we're going to back out. And that's all right as a buyer. Okay. So that's how these work. 
So, but once the thing to remember is I like to shorten the contingencies as much as possible that when it's fair to our client, because uh, there's no reason to uh, belabor issues if it's not in everybody's best interest. And I want my offer accepted. And that's why I'm trying to streamline it as much as I can. So my offer is accepted, right? And but once again, if they are late, they being the seller side or late, uh, providing something to me that they should, there still is this cushion of five days built in. Okay. The sale of buyer's property. It's not in my particular offer, but let's say it was. Let's say she had to take the funds out of the house she's living in to buy this one. And that would be a contingency of that sale. So I would check this, check this box and the form COP would, would be attached to the transaction. And that COP stands for contingency of purchase. <laughs> Excuse me. And that would be attached uh, to the uh, offer. Time of possession. Typically, it's uh, upon the notice of recordation. I made it till six o'clock on that same day. The reason I like it to be at that time is so we don't have a moving truck coming in while a moving truck is coming out and it gets confusing and hectic when we're all closing and moving in on the closing date. So that's one way to do it. Sometimes, and I usually if I'm a listing agent, will at least allow a couple of days my seller after the close of escrow. As a negotiation term, you may offer more days. So in this last market we're coming out, they were offering the seller to stay in escrow for like two weeks or a month after the close of escrow. How do we do that? So and that's the case. If we wanted the sellers to have the ability to remain in escrow for 14 days after we close, we would check this box, write 14 days, and they would use uh, form SIP, which is, stands for seller in possession. And now on this form, the seller would have the right to stay in the property for an additional 14 days after the close of escrow. Now, we have choices when it comes to this form. We can say, uh, and remember these words, the seller will pay the buyers P-I-T-I. -I, that's principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Now, if the seller is paying the buyer's PITI, then it's 100% fair because it's not costing the buyer any money for the seller to stay in there. It's only costing the buyer's time, okay? But if I was trying to offer it as a negotiation strategy, I would say 14 days free. So the seller can stay there for 14 days or it can be anything in the middle. He can say at $100 a day, for the 14 days, you know, it can be whatever you want it to be. Um, but just know you have those options, but the entirely fair, even Steven uh, choice is seller to pay buyers PITI. And sometimes the sellers are shocked at the amount of the payment that the buyer is paying because they bought it many years ago for much less money. And once they sign it, they may not be aware of what they're signing for. So that as a listing agent, we want to pay attention to that. If we use that SIP form, it's good for 29 days or fewer. Say we wanted the seller to stay in there for 45 days. Then we would use what's called the RLAS form. We check that box and that would be for more than 30 days. And that would be the residential lease after sale. And the same thing on this. It, it can be for buyers PITI. It can be for free or it can be for a dollar or a hundred dollars a day. It can be anything that you uh, both agree to but that's how we do it. Just note that our LAS uh, form is typically done for um, 59 days or fewer because lenders don't usually like a buyer to stay in there. Actually, lenders don't like a buyer to stay in there for more than 29 days because they kind of deem it a rental. But if they, but this form is for 59. I have seen a lender in my life, a couple lenders actually, that have allowed a buyer to stay in for over the 59 days, but it's not typical. So we always want it, if possible, to stay, use the SIP. It's a little, a little cleaner, but if you need to have a longer period, we're gonna use the RLAS. What happens if you buy a property with tenants in there? So in that case, we would check this box and the TOPA form would um, be attached and that's a tenant occupied purchase addendum. And that would be attached to this. And on that form, you would have a choice that the buyer is buying it with the tenants in place and they're staying in after the close of escrow. Or you could have the buyers typically out five days 
before the close of escrow. And we could make that actually as a contingency of closing escrow, because if we're buying a house, we don't want necessarily tenants to be staying over if that's our motive. So we want to pay attention to what our buyer uh, wants it to be, you know, because buyers have different feelings. And uh, that's basically what we're talking about, you know, what's in their best interest and how they want to proceed. But that's how we do it is with the TOPA form. Okay. The next section is a document fees and compliance. Uh, so the seller, the seller uh, delivers the documents within seven days after acceptance, sign and return escrow uh, documents within five days after delivery, pay for the HOA fees within three days after acceptance. And that's typically done by the seller. The reason being these homeowners associations really drag their feet and they have to put a check into escrow to give to the HOA or they won't start drawing the documents. And we don't want escrow to drag on for that. So that's why we have such a short period here. We want to get those uh, that ball rolling. Install smoke alarms, water heater bracing, bracing uh, gas shut off valves, whatever, whatever is required that we're agreeing to within seven days. That's pretty quick. It's okay with me. But sometimes if I was representing a seller, I may say 15 days just to give us a little breathing room. But that's fine. Seven days is fine. I have no problem with it. And then evidence of representative authority. And that's when uh, the buyer is purchasing as an entity. Remember before I said JS Construction was purchasing it, or maybe my buyer, Bonnie Buyer, is buying it in the Bonnie Buyer Family Trust. If that was the case, I have to, within three days, explain how that's going to happen and who has the authority to do that. And actually, I could do it on the offer itself, and I'm going to talk about that when we get to that section. So now we're done with page two. Only 75 more pages to go, huh? Okay, so now the buyer will uh, initial here and we're going to move on to page three. The next section is items excluded and included. One thing I want you to remember is that when we write this offer, the offer that we write and the subsequent counter offers are the Bible that we follow. So even if the MLS says this is included or this is not included, it doesn't matter what the MLS says. We can use that as a guidance for what we're asking for or what we know the other side would like to leave or take with them. It does. It is not the law, so to speak, of our contract. What we write here is actually the law on the agreed uh, things that we're taking. So whether it's personal property or, or typically it is personal property or whatever it is that we're asking for, this is where we do it. So let's talk about this for a second. So I've asked for the stove, refrigerators, the wine refrigerator, the washer and dryer. You know, even if even if in the MLS it says um, appliances not included, if I wanted to ask for it, I could. I'm not sure I would in that case because I want my offer accepted. But if I did want to and my buyer wants to because they're paying so much money, that's fine. That's up to them. Uh, one caution, uh, Sometimes in our contract, it may say that built-in appliances are included, and uh, and that's that. So we don't may not have to to check it here. However, I'm going to tell you a real short story that happened to me my first year in real estate. In my contract at the time, it said built-in appliances are included, and the stove built-in was included. We did our walkthrough; everything was fine. It looked like it was a built-in stove. We went when and at the walkthrough was there. We closed escrow. My buyers moved in, and they called me and said the stove's gone. The sellers took the stove. I said, "Can't be. We're going to sue them. You know how can they take the stove?" Then I looked into it, and as a new agent, I really didn't realize it. It was not a built-in stove. It was just a stove, a freestanding stove. So they had the right because I did not include it in my contract. So how do you think we remedy that situation? Good guess. I had to buy them one. Okay, so because I bought them one now for the rest of my life, whether the stove is built in or not, I will check that box. So that's what I'm talking about. So even if you think it's included, there's no harm in specifying that it is like I want the refrigerator. I don't want them to give me the old beat up one in the garage. Maybe I want both. So I'm going to write that refrigerator and I'm going to write the GE refrigerator in the garage. I want to be very specific on this stuff. Perhaps around the swimming pool, there were red wicker chairs and brown wicker chairs. And the red ones were, you know, you sit in it, there were people were falling through and there, the bottoms are gone. They didn't want them. So if I just asked for the wicker chairs around the pool, I could have gotten that. So I want to be real specific and say, I want the brown wicker chairs. And there are four of those. So I want four. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Be very, very specific. As far as exclusions, the same thing. 
I had an escrow not too long ago that the buyer did not want the above ground spa. It was not built in, so it doesn't come with the house and the buyer didn't want it. So why do I put it here? Because my buyer did not want to take the expense of having and hassle of moving it. So we said we want the seller to exclude it. The seller has to take it with them and end of story, unless of course they counter me. Sometimes you're going to see things like the dining room chandelier excluded. I talked to the listing agent. Why? Because it was a wedding gift and has sentimental value. Okay. So I want my offer accepted. So I said the dining room chandelier is excluded. So there probably will be a hole in the ceiling where that was. So I don't want to uh, muddy the waters right now. I want my offer accepted. So I will probably deal with that hole in the ceiling when we do our inspection and maybe ask for them to replace it or ask for a credit uh, of some sort to cover that amount. And while I'm talking about that credit, let me just say something, uh, just to go back here for a second. On the previous page, when we talked about investigation, now when we investigate, like let's say that the we find out the air conditioning doesn't work. Okay, now, we have a couple of choices. We talked to an air conditioning repairman, and they say it will cost uh, six thousand dollars to either replace this particular unit or uh, or repair it or whatever the case may be. And there, you know, there may be 10 other things wrong with the house, but I'm just trying to make it simple. So so we have, so I, what I would do, I would give what, uh, what's called a request for repairs. And I give that to the seller and to the seller's agent. And I, on that request, I would say uh, seller to replace the air conditioning unit, or I would say seller to credit buyer $6,000 for the unit. You know, sometimes there are things like fireplaces. It could be 75,000, it could be whatever, but I'm just using this number just to talk. Okay, so with this $6,000. So let's say we went back and forth and the seller says, okay, you know, I don't wanna hassle with it. I will give you $6,000 for that repair. So how do we do that? We never ever send this request for repairs to escrow. That's one thing I wanna say, because when you do that, you're going to make it uh, part of your uh, escrow. We don't want that. We don't want our lender receiving any requests for repairs, or we don't want our lender receiving any inspection reports. So this is between buyer and seller. Once we come up to an agreement, then we would have what's called an addendum to the purchase contract that the buyer and seller would sign. It would say seller to credit buyer $6,000 towards, towards buyer's closing costs. And we'd send that amendment, an addendum to the purchase agreement to escrow, an addendum, I should say, and escrow will draw an amendment stating that if everybody agrees, and then everybody's hunky-dory, and that's how you do it. Or you can reduce the purchase price by that amount if you like, if that's what you want uh, to do, be going back and forth. And I don't want to take too much time with this, but I just want to explain to you that's how it's done. Whatever you find after your investigation or your inspections, how you handle it is you write a request for repairs and you submit it to the listing agent who shares it with the seller. And then the seller will either uh, respond to you, agree to do it, or they can just totally ignore you. There's no, uh, there's no uh, pre-written uh, um, right and a, a definite right that the seller has to respond. The seller does not have to respond. So what do you do in that case? Either go forward and continue the, the transaction without that request being um, listened to and adhered to, or you can ask, uh, you can, uh, the buyer can cancel because that investigation contingency is still open. So it's tricky. That's how you have to be real careful with all this stuff, but that's how you do it because there will be uh, things that we have to negotiate in every single contract after you do your inspections. Okay. Very rarely is there a perfect house. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to the next page. We already went on that section. Now we're going to talk to the allegation of, of costs. So who pays for what? So in every one to four units in the state of California, the seller has to provide the buyer with an NHG report, which is a natural home hazard zone disclosure report. That basically talks about if it's in a flood zone where the earthquake uh, uh, zones are, the proximity to them, if the property is in liquefaction, all that, and that's what's called an NHD report. The state in its wisdom said the seller has to provide it, but it did not say the seller has to pay for it. So right now, if we want the buyer to pay for it, we could do that. Typically, the seller pays for that, and that's the custom in our area. So that's what I wrote. 
I also said the environmental. It does not usually cost more money. Why not get the full report from my buyer? So that's what I checked on that. Uh, then I want to say what company I uh, want to use. I could say seller's cho choice, excuse me. I could say buyer's choice. Uh, I said property ID, so I made that choice. We don't want to leave it blank. You want to have either uh, the name of a company or seller and buyer's choice. Blank report paid by buyer or seller or both. This would be a typical thing like I was just talking about your inspection. A lot of times an agent will come to me when they want me to approve their contract or if it happens to me and I'm a listing agent and I'll say inspection report paid for by buyer. What's wrong with that? The buyer's paying for it. Why wouldn't we sign it? The reason is that if it says inspection report, no matter who pays for it, it becomes part of this contract and this lender can request it. And once the lender sees this inspection report, they're not going to lend on the property because the inspection report is going to make it seem as if we have a good, strong sneeze and the property is going to fall over. OK, so that's why we don't want that. We don't want it here. That doesn't take away any right of the buyer. If you read the inspection contingency and investigation contingency, they can record and inspect anything that they want uh, from A to Z. So this does not take away rights. What it does is just sometimes put a snag in a transaction. So if I if I am a listing agent and I get one like that, I will say uh, Q2 deleted in its entirety and I will just take it right out. Okay. Smoke alarms, water heater bracing, government required point of sale inspections and reports, and government required point of sale corrective or remedial actions. All of these are typically paid for by the seller in our area. So that's what I wrote. Some cities that we work in don't have point of sale inspections required and point of sale corrective remedial actions required. If you're in the city of Los Angeles, not the county, I think it would typically be required. But for instance, if you're in Burbank or you're in Calabasas or Santa Monica, I think Beverly Hills or Ventura County, there's no uh, retrofit inspection required. And what that means, like, so for instance, if you saw a house in West Hills or Van Nuys, uh, you have a retrofitter come out there and he certifies the smoke detectors are in, the low flow devices are in, uh, they may uh, need to install a gas shutoff valve, earthquake shutoff valve, that kind of thing. And if he cites that one of those things are missing and we have this agreed to here, seller has to do it by the close of escrow or whatever time period that we wrote. And But that's a, that's a city mandated um, item. So we have to do it if indeed it is in that city. So if it's in the city, it has to be done. And now we're just saying who pays for it. So like I said, it's customary in our area for the seller to pay for it. So that's what I did. Uh, escrow fee. Typically, the, the cleanest way, in my opinion, unless there's something specific that's different, but 99 times out of 100, or maybe more than 99 times out of 100, I would check this box, each to pay their own fees. Escrow holder, I'm asking for encore escrow. If I was in a really strong multiple offer situation and I was trying to avoid a counter offer, maybe I would write seller's choice. But typically I'll write on or encore escrow. And as far as title, I would write progressive title because I want to use our affiliates because they're great. They give good service and I want to support them if I have a chance. Uh, who pays for them as far as uh, title insurance, typically the seller. So that's what I wrote. Okay. So either way, I do not want to leave this empty. So my choices here are the company I want to choose or seller's choice or buyer's choice. We don't want to leave it empty. Uh, the buyer's lender uh, title insurance policy, that's usually a lender fee. So that's already automatically uh, defaults to the buyer. The county and city transfer tax, uh, that can be a substantial amount. I think it's $5.60 per thousand, which really adds up. Customarily, it's paid for by the seller. So that's what I wrote here. Uh, HOA uh, prepared documents paid for by the seller. HOA cert fee, if we needed one, would be paid for by the buyer. Tran HOA transfer fees, typically paid for by the seller. And that's what I wrote. Private transfer fees. We want to check who would be paying for that if it was a private transfer fee. In my years, I've never seen a private transfer fee, but I know there possibly could be one. If there was, then we would write who to pay for it. 
other fees or allocation of costs. If there were something else that you could think of, um, I don't want to muddy the waters now. So I'm going to say, usually we're going to leave this blank. So I'll leave that blank. Uh, next, we come to the home warranty plan. We want the home warranty uh, to be on every property that we sell. Okay. Every one to four uh, plex. So it's either a single family or up to four units. We want a home warranty on it. So how do we find out what it's worth? In your office, you're going to have brochures from different home warranty companies. I looked at this particular house, $850,000 would give this buyer a good home warranty. So I said buyer's choice because I don't want uh, the, the company will be buyer's choice. Buyer can decide what company they want to use. I have enough things to think about right now. I don't want to muddy the waters right now with what company my buyer is going to use and what options my buyer is going to choose. You know, I might actually write a company here. I'll do that more often than not. So maybe I'll write Fidelity or First American or Choice Home Warranty, whatever, whoever uh, is a good home warranty that you, you know, you meet the reps in your office and you're comfortable, write that company name, that's fine. But make sure you do this. Buyer to choose options prior to close of escrow or fill out what the options are here. The options would be something like, you know, pool, spa, um, maybe air conditioning, maybe external plumbing, maybe guest house or, you know, uh, uh, other dwelling unit, whatever it is. You know, you have a lot of choices. I don't want to be bothered by that right now. So at this point, I just pick the amount that I want buyer's choice in this case, and buyer to choose options prior to the close of escrow, and we're covered. But we do want a home warranty on every property we sell, because that's when things typically go wrong when they transfer or during that first year, and it alleviates a ton of lawsuits. And typically, the sellers are used to paying for that, so it shouldn't be a problem. Always get a home warranty. My buyer told me that she has a real estate license. Imagine that. So she's not a working realtor. And if she was, that would be fine. But she's not. She's never even used it, but she has one. So I had to disclose that. So how would I do that? In other terms, I write buyer holds an active California real estate license. And that's how we address that. Then the buyer uh, would initial the bottom of this page. We move on to page four. Okay. In this particular version of the contract, thank goodness, uh, they address these certain types of purchases. For instance, if we bought a probate property and a property that even required a court confirmation of a probate sale, uh, prior to this contract, we'd have to write a probate probate contract or a manufactured home purchase contract, you know, if we were using those specific types of property. But now all we have to do is do an addendum. So if it's a probate purchase, I will check that box and add the probate agreement purchase addendum. And on that addendum, it'll cover all the things that are needed when we buy a probate property, whether it's with court confirmation or not. And all these addendums are pertinent to the type of property that they are talking about, okay? Other addendums. Uh, we always, always, on every property we sell, want to have the Rodeo Realty Addendum and the Rodeo Realty Affiliated Business Disclosure Addendum. Those have to be in every property that we sell. The Rodeo Addendum discloses a lot of things uh, that are pertinent to a buyer's purchase, and the Rodeo Affiliated uh, describes what uh, companies that Rodeo may have a financial interest in. So by law, we have to disclose them. And even whether we're using our companies or not, it has to be on every transaction. Um, what else did I want to say? Uh, other buyer and seller advisories. These were pre-checked. So these were already added to the contract. I talked about some of them. I'll talk about more at the end of this contract. But like some people, well, they will check the statewide buyer and seller advisory to be you know, added to this. So I decided not to, because that's another 14 pages added to this. So I don't want to make it uh, too big of a, a, a of a deal for my buyer to go through all this stuff at the time we're writing an offer. You can, and that's fine. But I want to make the distinction, even though it's not attached to our contract, remember it was attached to our contract, the lender gets it, escrow gets it. 
but let's not confuse the fact that it has to be in our file. So in our file, we're going to have to have the statewide buyer advisory and a million other documents that are required for our closing package with our company. So, and all the companies have required documents in, uh, most of the things that are required are usually required by all of the companies or most companies in any regard. So even though I want, I will definitely have a statewide buyer and seller advisory, and I would definitely have it uh, in my file and it's required. And if I don't have it, I'm probably not going to get my check at the close of escrow. So I will have it in there, but I don't want to have it in my escrow instructions and use it at this point. So I just wanted to make that distinction because sometimes people get confused. Uh, why not include it now or why include it now? So it's a half a dozen, one way, six the other, but we do need it. Okay, so now we're gonna get into all the terms of the contract. And I talked about a lot of these, but please, when you have a chance, really read this contract. I paraphrased a lot of this stuff, uh, so it's covered, but uh, you really should read the contract. And I don't wanna be here, you know, cause it would take me, uh, you know, eight hours to go through every single word of this, but I want you to do that at your convenience. So on the bottom of page four and every additional page, the buyer is going to initial as well as the seller when they accept it. So now I'm gonna move ahead to page 14. It's here somewhere. We're on page nine, okay? Just gotta go a little further here. Okay, page 14. Now, if you remember on the first page, we made our deposit to be 3% of the purchase price. And I told you I would tell you why. So the reason why is because of this liquidated damages clause. So what this says, if a buyer fails to complete this purchase price because of buyer's default, seller shall retain as liquidated damages, the deposit actually paid if the, if the property is a dwelling unit with no more than four units, one of which buyer intends to occupy, then the amount retained shall be no more than 3% of the purchase price. Any excess shall be returned to buyer. So that's the legal amount that we're allowed to keep should a buyer default. Default does not mean that they inspected the property and they decided not to go forward. Default does not mean they didn't qualify for their loan during their loan contingency period. Default means uh, that they just decided they're not going forward in an illegal manner after there's every there's no legal reason why they shouldn't. So um, if a buyer defrauds a seller or defaults a seller and they sign this, then that deposit will typically remain with the seller should they go down that course of action. That being said, nothing is clear cut, but that's the way it's supposed to work. So why would I have my buyer sign this? Number one, for good faith. My buyer is not planning on defaulting or defrauding anybody. She's going in here in good faith. So she wants the seller to know that. If I didn't have my buyer sign this, most likely the seller would counter and want it signed. Okay. If for some reason, like say we were in a crazy market and my buyer didn't sign this and the seller decided they wanted to go over damages for whatever reason, maybe they decided they lost more money than the 3%, they can go after more if this deposit is, this clause is not signed. So that's why it's actually in my buyer's protection and uh, interest as well to sign this. But it, it's a good thing for both sides. So typically we have this in every um, transaction we go through. It's not required but it's a good idea. Mediation, that means should there be a problem between buyer and seller, buyer and broker, seller, broker, 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 we'll go to mediation first before a point of law. Arbitration of disputes. I'm not gonna read this whole paragraph, but this basically says that rather than go to a court of law, if this paragraph is initial, we will have a professional uh, arbitrator who is typically a retired or maybe not retired real estate uh, judge, somebody very qualified, and they'll make a uh, decision on who is right and who is wrong and a penalty if there is one. Now, why would we not want to sign this? Well, the seller wouldn't want to uh, have this not signed typically because they don't want to tie up the property in a, a legal process that may take years, right? And so who doesn't want to sign this? Very typically, a lot of lawyers don't want to sign this. But I represented a lawyer last year on a property and she was crossing up, uh, you know, sentences throughout the contract. Then she came here and she said, I'm not signing this. And, uh, and, and I said, you know, congratulations, you just negotiated yourself out of having your offer 
accepted. And she says, why? I said, because the, and I said, because the seller is going to be scared to death that you're going to sue him, especially if you're an attorney. So there's two sides of, uh, of every uh, situation. So just think about it in that way. Even if you have an attorney, you know, if they don't want to sign it and they don't have to sign it. I mean, you know, every, the buyer and the seller make their own um, decisions. We can't control them, but there's a logical reason why we want these things signed. It's better. It costs less money. And it's, it just, in my opinion, better all the way around. But of course it's up to the parties uh, to make their own decision. So on this particular page, the buyer would initial three sections, one, two, three. And now we're going to move on. The next page is, remember I told you about an entity buyer. So say my buyer was buying it in the form of a trust. Um, doesn't typically happen as a buyer, but say she was. So and if that was the case, I would check entity buyer. The name of the authorizer's signer, in my case, will be Bonnie Buyer, trustee. And I would see over here of the Bonnie Buyer Family Trust, if that was the name of the trust. Remember, remember I talked about JS Construction buying it. So if JS Construction was buying it, it would be John Smith, managing member of JS Construction Company, that kind of thing. So that's what I mean by an entity, not a, not a person. So sometimes entity buy it. Then I would have my buyer sign it. So the buyer has a full signature here. And if there's more than one buyer, they would sign it there. If there's more than two signers, then we would check this box and would use the additional signature addendum. And that would be added to this transaction. Now it's time to accept it. Let's put in our, our change our coats for a second, our hats, and we're going to be a seller's agent. So now if we're going to accept this offer, our seller's going to accept it, I should say. And typically there's a counter offer almost in every offer that's received. It's very unusual not to, so you get used to that. We don't, we don't want the seller to sign it if they choose on making a signer off a counter offer without initialing this box, because that would be a bad mistake to make. So the so seller would sign every page of this offer and this box with the counter offer. So they're accepting this offer subject to what they're countering in that counter offer. And the counter offers are done in a linear fashion. I'm not going to get into that today, but just know that's how it works. And you can go, you know, you know, the seller can counter, then the buyer can counter back the seller. It can go on and on until they come to a full agreement. And that's what I mean by a linear fashion, uh, fashion, because each item is countered as time goes on until what the last remaining counter is in effect, and that takes precedence. So, in anyways, so if there's a counter, we're going to sign that box. And now, if the seller is an entity, which happens happens more frequently than a buyer, I might check the box here to seller. So the seller would be uh, John Smith trustee and Mary Smith trustee of the Smith family trust dated 1987, if that was the case. So that's how we handle that. If we don't do it here, then we'd have to have another form within three days added to the transaction called an RCSD form, it's a representative capacity disclosure addendum. And this, by signing this, it negates that form being needed. Then we'll have the seller have a full signature here. And if there were more than one, they would both sign there. And if more than two, they would use that additional signature addendum. If the offer is not accepted, the seller will initial this and date it. And that way the buyer knows it's not accepted and the offer was reviewed. The real estate broker section, <clears throat> we should really fill this out. And I wanna also fill out to the best that I can, my uh, listing agent's information too, because it's more professional to have all this information on there. And the more professional we appear going in, the more likely your offer is to be accepted. So I write Rodale Realty Inc. Uh, my name, my license number, Rodale license number, my address, my office address, I mean, uh, where it is in Westlake Village, how to contact me with any information, counter offers, notices, et cetera, and my phone number. And that would typically be um, <clears throat> my cell phone. And I'd also put my cell phone here if I wanted that to be you know, used. Uh, on the other broker, I would actually look up and make sure they have their license number and the company and agent's license number and any other information I can. If we don't have that information, then of course they would fill it out. The next section here is an escrow holder acknowledgement that typically is uh, filled out by escrow. 
and what it does when they fill it out. They fill it out and they become authorized to follow the terms of the contract as it is written. Some escrow companies have their own page rather than this, but we do usually want an escrow holder acknowledgement. And the presentation of offer, we do want the agent or the seller preferably to sign this, that the offer was presented on this date. Because sometimes you don't have an offer, uh, a, a, um, a notice that your offer was was you know presented and you're sitting here in the dark and your buyers may get very anxious and we have a right to know that it was. And this is how we do it right here. So we want to insist that we get that returned, this page with them signing on uh, that it was viewed and rejected. <clears throat> Buyer and seller will initial the bottom of this page as all the pages. Buyer's investigation advisory. In addition to everything that we wrote in the body of the contract that I was talking about, all the inspection rights, we also want to point out they are uh, can invest all of these items because each item here would probably uh, resulted in a lawsuit. And that's why we want to make sure the buyer knows they can investigate all these issues and they should. And in addition to this, I'm not putting it in our contract here, but there's another addendum called uh, BIE, which stands for Buyer Election Investigation Elections. And that has like another 40 things that they can inspect. So we want to have our buyer sign that as well, even if I don't make it part of the contract. Because we want our buyer to um, know and acknowledge that they have the right to investigate everything. So it's not going to be us put on the hook that we didn't tell them they have a right to investigate. We want them to know. So this is a two-page uh, addendum here. The buyer is going to sign that. And uh, we'll move on to the next form. The next form is the Fair Appraisal Act addendum. And this one is just stating that uh, the appraisal will be done fair uh, without any coercion from us. And it, it's a fair and just appraisal. We don't want to pay off appraisers. Of course, now we'd lose our real estate license, but that's or redlining, that's the type of thing we're speaking of. And so the buyer and seller will sign this because the appraisal is going to be based on whether the lender, you know, lends on this property or not. So we want a fair and just appraisal. Then we come to the Consumer Privacy Act Advisory. On this particular uh, form, we're just acknowledging uh, that the buyer and seller want to acknowledge that we kind of live in a fishbowl and information, once it's on the MLS and the internet, it's out there. We can't uh, call it back because once it's out, it's out. We can't put the genie back in the bottle, so to speak. So sometimes you'll have uh, buyers buy the property and they're upset that the pictures are still on the internet. Not, nothing we can do about that. Also, we're telling them that the details of the sale are typically made public. You know, so in the tax records, it'll say who the owner of the property is and what they paid for it, you know, that kind of thing. And then the MLS says that kind of thing as well. So anyways, uh, that's what this uh, document is saying. Now we come to our addendums. Remember, I spoke to you about the Rodeo addendum. Here's the addendum to every contract we write. And once again, uh, first of all, Rodeo charges a $250 fee that the buyer only pays upon the close of escrow. If we don't close escrow, the buyer doesn't have to pay it, but that's where we write that $250 fee. Uh, buyers, once again, we're asking them to inspect all these items and we're saying some things that may or may not be addressed in other forms, but there's no harm in saying it again and again and again. We want to make sure that the buyer understands that they can inspect for all these items. And this says a little bit what the broker duties are. You know, if they want to investigate a toxic mold, rent control, warranty plans, et cetera, et cetera, they have the right to do it. And we're acknowledging that we told them on our addendum. Then the next one is the Rodeo Affiliated Business Arrangement Disclosure Statement. And of course, this is what I was talking about. If this states um, what companies that Rodela has a financial interest in. And it also says what our escrow fees are at Encore Escrow, what LA Mortgage's fees are typically, and what the title for, for progressive title company fees are. Whether we use them or not, we want buyer and seller to sign this because we have to make that disclosure. And then finally, I want to tell you about this addendum. Now, this is not actually part of the contract. But this is actually a worksheet that may help you because if you recall at the beginning, I said we're writing this offer 
at a million dollars. So the numbers are very easy to do in our head, but sometimes they're not so easy. So when we use this purchase agreement financing structure worksheet, we add this to the transaction in zip forms. And when we fill it out there, the numbers appear on our contract. So I would enter the purchase price in this case. I would say the purchase price is a million dollars. And I would say my buyer wants to put in 3%. So I click that box and that 3% is $30,000. If she wanted to put a 2% deposit, it'd be $20,000. If she wanted to put a 5% deposit, it would be $50,000. So why would she put a 5% deposit? Maybe uh, just to be grandiose and maybe just to impress a seller that I have a lot of money and I'm putting it down. Still, if they were, uh, because of the um, uh, the agreement that we, that we signed uh, earlier, if we're talking about that 3% of the purchase price, uh, if they signed that, they still couldn't go after the whole entire amount. Remember that that said uh, that the buyer, uh, the seller, excuse me, can only go after 3% of the purchase price, even if we put in 50. So that would be the thought behind there. But anyways, typically we do three. So 3% is $30,000, which is there. My buyer is getting a um, an 80% loan. So that's $800,000. And click that box. These are the numbers and those will appear on the first page of the contract. So you don't have to use this addendum, but it may be helpful for you uh, to use that. And if you wanna figure it out, you know, what we're talking about, whether the liquidated damages clause or the loan amount, all that stuff. Sometimes, you know, buyers can get a different kind of loan than they're saying in the contract and they have the right to do whatever they want. But if they can't get the kind of loan they want, they're bound to the type of loan that they specified in their contract. So we wanna be very, very careful that they have the ability to do whatever we write down in the contract because that's what they're held by, okay? And so when we do present our offer, we will not send this worksheet with it. There's no harm if you do, but there's no reason to. And we'll add all the documents that I talked about, you know, the buyer's uh, proof of funds uh, and a letter from the lender or proof of cash, if it's an all cash offer, that kind of stuff, everything attached to your offer. And then you would submit it to the other side. And I think that is it for this uh, crash course on how to fill out the contract correctly the first time. I hope you guys have joined it enjoyed it. Excuse me. I'm going to stop the sharing right here. And I wish you guys the best. And if you ever want a copy of this particular contract, I just email me, Mark Shepard of Rodale RE, and I will shoot it over to you because sometimes it's good to have this template, uh, you know, on your possession when you're writing a contract and you're not used to it. Wish you all the best. And at that time, you have completed the class. Thank you very much.